Tom Looney has worked in a range of startup and large technology companies throughout his career. He worked at Oracle. He worked for Steve Jobs at Next. He helped launch Active Software, which went public in 1999. He led the formation of Next Channel Partners that was later rolled into Microsoft, where he then worked as Industry Director for Homeland Security and Public Safety. He is currently the co-founding partner of Seahawk Innovation Management. Please welcome Tom Looney. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. It's such a nice crowd. Um, I thought I'd begin by telling you that um, Tripp uh, made his comments about getting married this weekend. Uh, my wife, Trish, and I just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary right around Thanksgiving. Thank you. And you know, um, we've had an amazing marriage, I think a lot because I traveled all over the world on business for so many years. But you know, even on, it happens that our anniversary coincides with Thanksgiving and I was, um, you know, it was a lovely weekend really, but I did at one point, you know, have one of those moments where you just said, dear God, couldn't I just be single, you know, for, you know. And I think God misheard me because I wound up uh, getting a case of shingles right thereafter. <laughs> or maybe he really did hear me and he thought that's what I deserve. <laughs> so if I say anything today that uh, seems way off kilter or inappropriate, it's because of the pain meds. <laughs> oh. Go the right way. So. The topic I'm going to talk today about is economic um, identity and economic development um, because it's a passion of mine. And it's interesting that in the program today, I noticed that three years ago when I did speak at another Power Breakfast event, it was about place branding. So it's appropriate I am here three years later talking about it. And like then, I'm going to make the case um, for innovation to be the tip of the spear and how we identify ourselves uh, in terms of our business identity and the strategy we use for economic development and the actual execution plan we use as well. And it's important because what I'm going to hopefully prove to you today, and it seems remarkable, but it's true, that if we took 100% of our finite dollars and invested it in innovation development, there's no better way to create good paying jobs and multiple good paying jobs for people that are less educated and less skilled. It's a paradox, perhaps, but I hope I can explain it to you and why it's so important. Um, the book, The New Geography of Jobs, is by the author Enrico Moretti. It was called by Forbes magazine last year the most important book of 2012. And those who know me know that I tend to rely heavily on data-driven insights to form, hopefully, you know, fact-based uh, insights into into the thinking and some of the way I run my businesses over the many years I've done that. And, and the first thing that Moretti um, does is lay out a case, what he calls the, that the United States isn't a national economy. And in fact, there's not even a state economy. It's very hard to say, well, the North Carolina state economy is defined as this. It's actually, in his world, we're, we're living in um, three economies, and he calls it this great divergence that's underway, where some places in the United States are thriving and other places are in a long, slow, steady decline. And the, the forces of agglomeration that are occurring um, are positive for the places that are growing and succeeding, but they're brutal for the places that are in that long, slow um, descent. Um, he describes and he says there's only three possible paths, there are actually really only two, that these 360 metropolitan statistical areas or MSAs in the United States can go. The first is an innovation hub. They're the ones that are expanding and winning. The second one is a traditional manufacturing hub and they're the places that are losing population and that are suffering a brain drain and, and have a lot of um, problems, and a lot of the problems that were described by some of our other uh, brilliant speakers this morning. And, and then the, he describes a third group that are undecided. And he says they could go either way, and there's a lot of different forces at play, some out of their control as to where they fall. But it's a really interesting way to begin the discussion. So it's, it's pretty clear that there's some major indicators that you can imagine as to what, what the size is a place winning or losing. And, and it, and it comes a lot of around education. So 
the um, education attainment levels of adults age 25 and above is a statistic that's tracked very carefully. And the first thing I look at is the percentage of the people in the region that have a high school diploma. And then the next one is the percentage of the population that have some advanced education, college, master's degree, doctorate degree, and so forth. And then um, household incomes is important. And then that population growth, right? Because where you have population growth, it tends to mean that there's job opportunities and people tend to go to where the jobs are. Now, the painful reality of the United States economy is that, and I thought this one statement, I, I, I quoted it, if we dropped 70% of the USA's land mass, the national GDP wouldn't change. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So that means like 30% of the United States is producing the lion's share of the, the national GDP of the country. When I talk about innovation, so many people feel like, well, Tom, you know, fine, you know, you're a software industry guy and you got a master's degree and you taught college, but not everyone can, can, is like that. You know, we have to have a diverse economy and we have to create jobs for everyone and everything else. Why should everyone care about increasing regional innovation since most of us will never work for an innovation company or an innovation job? And the answer is, is because what Moretti proves with remarkable precision is that for every one innovation job we create, there's five additional jobs that are created in the non-innovation sectors. And they're good paying jobs spanning, you know, some in the, uh, what we call the, the professional services local economy and some in the maybe, um, you know, the low end of that. But nonetheless, five net new jobs for every one new innovation job. And that's why I said the best way to do innovation, diverse economic development for your entire population is to make sure you have a thriving innovation sector and you're investing your resources there and you're not doing things that would preclude that that from taking root in the, in the region. The halo effect is this very thing about this. Um, it drives jobs for everyone in the region. The, for years, economic development properly invested in manufacturing jobs because they had a 1.6 multiplier effect and that was the most efficient, best way to get returns on investment in economic development. Like we heard about education, you can't use a 20th century model in the 21st century and expect to be successful. By the way, not to make things complicated, but it turns out that advanced manufacturing is part of an innovation hub economy. So advanced manufacturing is now so complex, requires so many skills, and so integral to innovative companies that that's part of the definition of an innovation hub economy. So I'm an advocate of advanced manufacturing and advanced services jobs that make up the bulk of what we call the innovation hub. Now, um, the important thing about uh, this innovation hub model and everything I'm talking about is to make sure we understand the difference between traded sector versus non-traded sector. So let me spend a couple of minutes on that. It's really important. Most of us here today, most of us work and we compete in the local economy or the non-traded sector. Um, from land developers and real estate agents to waiters and uh, yoga instructors, um, that's the, uh, the non-traded local economy. Now, let me say, some of the greatest entrepreneurs I've ever met serve the non-traded sector. So this isn't about, well, you're saying we're not entrepreneurial, nor are we saying that you're, not, you're not educated. Lawyers, doctors, teachers at the university, teachers in the high school, you're all part of the non-traded sector of the economy. It's, it's, it's two-thirds of all the jobs, actually, in the United States are in the non-traded sector. It's a vibrant part of the economy. But they're the effect of economic growth. Most of those jobs are the effect of economic growth. The cause of economic growth and prosperity in any region is the health of its traded sector, right? So if you're going to want to look, create jobs for everybody, you want to have a robust traded sector and export its services and manufacture goods or where you do that. These are, it's, these are the businesses that export out to other states and to other countries around the world. Now, a quick word about services jobs, because again, sometimes in economic development, when we use 20th century paradigms to describe the 21st century reality, there's a disconnect. 
The United States services sector in terms of how we're doing there, $700 billion a year in annual services exports by the United States this year. So that's $700 billion with a B. And we have a surplus. So while we have a, a trading um, deficit in terms of manufactured goods, we have a surplus of a quarter of a trillion dollars. That's how good and competitive U.S. services are in the global economy. There's no better example of it than that beautiful building we all drove by today when we pulled it in. They were mentioned earlier, PPD. PPD is a services company. They don't make widgets. They don't make things. They're, they're a brain hub business, and, and they're doing business in 40 countries around the world. So the notion that, well, services jobs are low paying and services jobs can't export, silliness, right? We have to make sure that, especially for our political leaders, that they understand and make a distinction about what's going on. And not only are service jobs not low paying, not all service jobs are low paying, there's some of the highest paying jobs in any community, both in the traded sector and the non-traded sector, like Chancellor Miller, for example. Only. I knew it about that. Um, so this, this quote, and this is directly from Moretti's book, um, advanced manufacturing and advanced services jobs are the cause of local prosperity and the doctors, lawyers, roofers, yoga teachers are the effect. When Toby Getz, Dallas Romanowski and I started building the foundation what we're doing at Seahawk Innovation, working with the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UNCW, we had these foundational components of what an innovation economy should be and our contribution, what it would be. So the first thing is about place, right? It's place-based. It's university and education-centered. The focus is on young high-growth startups or gazelle companies, and gazelle companies are are startup companies that have hit the hockey stick in terms of growth. They're several years into this compounded annual growth, and now they're hiring hundreds of people. Brett Martin's Castle Branch is an example of a gazelle company. We're focused at Seahawk Innovation on doing the economic gardening of creating these small, promising, traded sector you know, innovation companies to hopefully become the next PPDs and the next, um, and the next Castle Branch and so forth. That's how we grow. So the case for innovation here in terms of um, what's talking about geography and jobs here, first off, like, um, like we heard about crime, um, all economies are regional. When we make statements about, well, here in New Hanover County, we have it this way, we're over there in Brunswick County, it's that way, that's a mistake. We need to have a regional alliance when it comes to economic development. And I think the reason we lost Brunswick County in the MSA calculations of the federal government was partly because there was no evidence that we were doing any coordinated, integrated work within the region in many ways. I think that was, that, that was a contributing factor. And I hope we learned some lessons there about the importance. If you look at Charleston, they, they several years ago created the Charleston Regional Development Alliance, and it's a really model for many others, they're following that model. They do economic scorecards. They do a lot of positive things there, and they certainly focus on their innovation hub identity comes forth in everything they do, and it's very clear. Um, so place-based development is really important. The primacy of place has never been more important because, of course, to attract these, these innovation workers, the well-educated, highly skilled workers that you want to draw, well, they have some they have some mandates in terms of the, they have a lot of choices of where they go. They're very mobile, and they want to go to beautiful places with good amenities, right? So when we think of economic development, and we say, well, we're going to do this one, or, or we're going to do this thing, we have to be mindful of doing things that are attracting people to this innovation hub identity and not repelling them with 20th century practices that may have once been effective. Um, going coastal is about, comparative advantage in, in, all, in all ways. So one is having a seaport, tremendous advantage for Wilmington because we can make the decisions here about what we import, and that tends to be what you want to call the low value commodities, and then what we export, hopefully the higher value, high quality or advanced manufacturing output would be the most effective way to leverage this asset of a port. Um, some of the other ones, marine biotech, tourism, and surfing, um, we've proven where, you know, National Geographic called uh, the Wilmington area one of the top ten surf destinations in the world. 
a remarkable opportunity to take and leverage. Um, now, the, the traits of, uh, of innovation hubs is that the investments are migrating to the highly skilled, not to low cost workers. And of course, that's again talking about 20th century versus 21st century. Human capital trumps physical capital. That's a huge thing to understand for, for developers because really it's about um, the human capital for companies that are going to be these high growth companies are being able to take something from 2 million to 3 billion in four years. That's, that's because you can't do that with physical goods. You have to do that with human capital. And then, of course, preserving and enhancing place is really important. You know, I was disturbed when I, we got that uh, survey it was done about economic development. And one, of the, one of the questions was, um, what are the five most anti-business things or what, what things are holding back business? And, and special use permit was put on that list. And I thought, that's crazy. It's crazy because they, they didn't give people the chance to express who wanted to say, well, that was actually one of the, the top five advantages we have. It's a very pro-business technique. And if you follow what's going on around the country, if you follow what's going on about innovation hub identity, I would caution people to be uh, quick to rush and judge that the special use permit is an effective pro-business tool. You have to really think a little different there. Um, no studies have been done that I've found on innovation hubs that sometimes act like they're still undecided. Um, I call that snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. And sometimes, you know, Wilmington has done so many good things. We take two steps forward, but we do take a step back. And this issue about our brand and our identity and what we should be from an economic development standpoint, identity, man, we, we really got to get that down. We have to really make some smart decisions there. Um, we have seen scenarios in recent years where just, you know, things are just almost incredible. I'm going to give one example. We lost Caterpillar, or supposedly lost Caterpillar because, of course, you know, months before that, people were predicting it was going to go to Georgia because it was going to be two more senators that they would have in their pocket, right, at Caterpillar. And so, and they didn't have any presence here. We had tremendous presence in North Carolina of Caterpillar. In fact, Caterpillar, the month that we said we lost Caterpillar because our port wasn't good enough and we didn't have roll-on, roll-off that could serve their needs, on the main page of the North Carolina Department of Commerce site, there was a positive article about Caterpillar expanding, I think, you know, a couple million square feet of additional space in North Carolina. And the port of Wilmington, roll-on, roll-off service was mentioned as a competitive advantage. Star News, a month after they wrote the articles about the port wasn't good and it can't win Caterpillar, they ran um, a headline that said the port shows off its Roro and, and had 18 photos of Caterpillar, various big equipment gear, rolling on to the ship out of the Port of Wilmington. I scratch my head at things like that. I mean, that's not synchronized, coordinated messaging and narrative. A success story is how I want to wrap up. And we have millions of success stories. And by the way, I think Wilmington business development has done a very good job. You know, if you look at their recent wins of the deals they've done, they've done it with innovation hub companies. When I think the one deal was with uh, GE's um, aerospace group, and, and it was some relatively small number of jobs, let's say it was 40. But those 40 jobs, we all now know, means 200 additional jobs not at GE, right? So that's really, that's how we have to be thinking. The clinical research initiative um, is a really good model of excellence of 21st century economic development. It was, uh, uh, you know, between Randall Johnson at the NC Biotech Center and, and the people in that industry, they got together and said, hey, let's tell this story, right? We have 20 CROs, 30 more companies that are in critical uh, or support um, roles to those clinical research companies. We have um, 2,700 total employees and average salary is $86,000. Well, just there alone, I think about 10,000 or so additional jobs that are being created, supported, funded as a result of the success of that cluster, that industry cluster. That's really important. So in closing, the prescription for the region to me is make innovation the tip of the spear of how we talk about Wilmington from a business identity, from a brand and from an economic development strategy, and then the action plans we do, because you have a strategy, and then you actually have to do what you say. That's, if you worked for Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison, you know you do what you say you're going to do, right? Um, and then the economic development focus should be on high-value services, because services are good, advanced manufacturing, 
And just this whole notion of taking high road policies versus the low road policies, because the high road development policies are the things that are going to help all of us continue to help this community grow and be the place we all know it has the potential of being. So thank you very much.